Hello, it's my pleasure to welcome you all to this policy panel where we will dive into the intersection between the voluntary carbon markets and the policies and regulations relating to climate change and carbon pricing. I'm Ben Rattenbury, Vice President for Policy at Silvera, and I'm delighted to have with me two esteemed panelists today, David Hines and Bianca Gishangi. Bianca is the coordinator of the East African Alliance on Carbon Markets, which convenes experts and market participants from the public and private sectors from across the seven countries in the region to develop training and set policies for carbon markets and carbon trading. Bianca is also a carbon markets negotiator at the UNFCCC, representing her native Kenya. David Hines is a carbon markets expert working at the Environment and Sustainability Consultancy Adelphi in Berlin. He's also part of the Secretariat for the International Carbon Action Partnership, or ICAP, one of the world's leading resources on emissions trading systems. And last November, David led on carbon markets for the UK's COP26 presidency team, meaning he is one of the co-authors of the famous Article 6 outcome. Bianca and David, thank you so much for joining me and welcome. Thanks for having us. Now, before we dive in, I should provide a health warning. This conversation may contain a few acronyms and some jargon. We'll try and keep it to a minimum, but I thought it would be helpful to start with a couple of quick definitions. David, as co-author of the Article 6 outcome at COP26, could you please very quickly explain Article 6, Article 6.2 and Article 6.4 for us? Uh, yeah, sure. So um, I think uh, Article 6, firstly, it, it is rather what it says on the T and it is the sixth article of the, the Paris Agreement, uh, which is why it's so-called. And essentially it deals with um, the different ways in which countries can work together to meet their targets under the Paris Agreement. So you can think of it as something quite broad, which is just encompassing cooperation generally. And within it, there are two substantive parts which relate to carbon markets. So the first of these is referred to as 6.2. Um, and 6.2 is really a, a framework for how you, you do the maths for what you trade. So um, it is a set of rules that is largely telling you what you need to track, uh, what you need to report on, and how you need to do the maths when it comes to uh, the end of your uh, NDC period, um, knowing what you can claim and what the people you've traded with can claim at the same time. So that is, it's lots of different types of activities can fit under it, but that's fundamentally what it's there to do. Um, Article 6.4 is a little bit different uh, for those in the audience who are familiar with the clean development mechanism. It is very similar in concept to that. Um, and it is essentially an institution which will exist under the UN to generate carbon offsets. So this is, it will administer the whole process of registering projects, producing methodologies, all the way through to issuing these credits in a registry so that people can trade them um, and claim them towards different purposes. Uh, and so it will essentially generate UN stamped offsets when it's up and running. That's great. Thank you so much, David. So just, just to recap then, Article 6.2 is the mechanism for countries to trade emissions reductions between them. And Article 6.4 is the new mechanism to uh, replace the clean development mechanism. Great. Thanks. Thank you very much. OK, so without further ado, then, let's dive into our conversation. To kick off with, I'd like to ask you both a general question. What do the voluntary carbon markets look like from the perspective of policymakers? Uh, Bianca. Yeah. Well, um, I'm coming from the perspective of uh, developing countries and seller country perspectives, uh, Eastern Africa particularly. And even though voluntary carbon markets are not um, new, I would say that for a lot of policymakers, it is new for them because beforehand it was. Um, focus on the CDM, which was a UNFCCC uh, mechanism and that the governments were operating with under the Kyoto Protocol. Um, but now we have a situation where uh, policymakers are concerned how different kinds of activities are affecting uh, their NDCs. And we know that if you decide to use Article 6, that it could have an impact on your NDC. And we know that um, there are provisions for uh, Corsia or other purposes, which we usually refer to as uh, voluntary carbon market activity uh, for which countries can, can authorize and then it would be able to um, have an impact on the NDC. So what I think policymakers are seeing this as is getting a lot of um, pressure, I'd say, from private sector developers 
who are seeking to have projects um, in their countries, uh, but then also the project developers are very conscious of transparency and credible units. So they are seeking for authorization, which basically would be permission from the government to internationally transfer um, these carbon credits. Um, so the situation now is uh, where the, there's a need for legal frameworks, uh, which isn't there before, but also for the policymakers, even they, even if the, if they they understand uh, what's required of them um, under the Paris Agreement. There's a lot of stakeholders on a national level who have no awareness. So there's a lot um, that's required um, with other, uh, with creating awareness with other government organizations and ministries, but also just other stakeholders like communities and you know um, consultants in the country, lawyers, anyone who's interested in carbon market activities. So they see it as something that needs a lot of capacity building. Um, where um, the government itself has to really understand what's going on um, uh, for the sake of their NDC, but also because a lot of stakeholders locally are really concerned as to what this is, how they can take part, and they need to be able to give that kind of a guidance. Yeah. That's great. Thanks, Bianca. David? Yeah, I, um, I I agree with Bianca that it, it all looks rather new, actually, from the policymakers' perspective. It, it should be said it's not actually new. The voluntary carbon market has been around almost as long as the compliance market. And it really, I mean, if you look at an uh, uh, organisation like Gold Standard, which serves largely the voluntary carbon market, it's been around for 20 years. So, so it's not new. Um, but the policymakers basically over the last 20 years have been focusing on the various forms of compliance markets. And so voluntary card markets, which have always been quite a niche concern with low volumes, have largely been left to, to develop on their own. Um, it should be said it, it's not completely untouched by policymakers. And the reason why is um, many of the credits that have been generated in the voluntary card market over the last, say, 10, 15 years, um, have been generated through the UN mechanism I mentioned earlier, the Clean Development Mechanism. And that, of course, is regulated by governments through the UN. So in that respect, you could see the generation part of the voluntary carbon market as having been regulated, although not by an individual government, uh, by collectively by governments at the international level. Uh, but the other parts of the market, uh, you know, trading, marketing, uh, you know, what you claim when you actually use an offset, these parts haven't really been touched uh, at all by policymakers. And I think really, if we look at what's happened in the last couple of years, it's it's really the growth in in the interest in the role of voluntary carbon markets, but also the actual size of the market itself, uh, the volumes that are being traded and the volumes that could be traded in the future, which has sort of forced this uh, upon policymakers. And it is not kind of thing actually that um, uh, they can ignore. Uh, and not least because of course everyone is aware to the risks of uh, greenwashing which has been a big problem with carbon markets in the past so policymakers are, are concerned about that uh, and the, they find themselves concerned with different elements now i mean um of course we have the questions of uh what is a good credit um and, uh, but also other things you know uh, how does this market market actually function who operates in it um, other claims that are being made, correct claims, what should be reported on, all of these kind of things, which the policymakers now really have to think about. Um, and this is, uh, we've already seen this actually a little bit uh, with the voluntary carbon market. For those who have been following the news recently, you may have seen uh, Indonesia very recently put on hold uh, uh, credit, voluntary uh, credit issuance under, under the verified carbon standard until uh, it can figure out what the interaction is with the, what it plans to do under Article 6. So uh, from a country perspective, there are also some grey lines. So this is sort of a, a sign that policymakers are still very much working through uh, what this new market means um, and uh, how it links to whatever they've committed to under the Paris Agreement. Thanks so much, David and Megan. That's really fascinating. So it sounds like policymakers have not paid that much attention to voluntary carbon markets historically, even though the clean development mechanism, which is ultimately um, set by governments through the UN has been one of the main drivers for the voluntary carbon markets historically. But now the voluntary carbon markets are growing so fast that actually governments are taking more and more interest. And then Bianca, you also mentioned the very important specific issue around governments being requested to grant authorization for new projects in order to be able to transfer units internationally. And then David, you mentioned greenwashing and really interesting example we've seen from the SEC over in the US in, in the last couple of months with their draft uh, rule on climate-related disclosures and um, a range of views that have been 
um, provide in a response to that. So really interesting. Thank you both for that that overview. So moving on then, there was a lot of excitement within the carbon markets community about the Article 6 outcome at COP26. But now that the dust has settled, what do you see as the main policy drivers influencing the voluntary carbon markets right now? David. Um, it's, a, it's an interesting question. I mean, before before the COP last year, there, there was a concern in some spaces of voluntary carbon markets that um, the negotiations were at risk of, of uh, extending their mandate, basically, and uh, so to speak, regulating voluntary carbon markets. Uh, personally, I think that's the wrong reading of how these things are, are interacting together. Uh, I think direct uh, people within the sphere can see quite clearly the distinct bits of the market that, say, Article 6 are, and, and the voluntary carbon market are serving. And uh, th there's, there's not a, an outcome which Article 6 is regulating uh, voluntary carbon markets. So, so we shouldn't really look for the policy drivers in that way. Uh, but they will come in other ways, I think. Um, one of the ways is that they, it may play out is how is depending on the rules that are agreed under Article 6, particularly Article 6.4. So what we have seen in the past is um, the rules that were agreed under the Clean Development Mechanism, the previous institution, proved very influential, actually, in just how the, the voluntary carbon market operated, not because anyone was forced to do anything, uh, but just because it did so much of the initial work uh, of getting these mechanisms up and running. And so people sort of piggybacked on those efforts. So that is a form of uh, indirect influence uh, on the voluntary carbon market. It is possible we will see that as well in the future. Much of the detailed guidance under Article 6 still has to be written, and that will develop in the coming years. And one would hope that we would see a dynamic relationship between what is agreed at the UN, um, how that is reflected in voluntary carbon markets, the best aspects of it, and also vice versa. I mean, one of the novel things, actually, that was in the guidance, which probably would have surprised some, was that um, this new Article 6.4 institution explicitly was requested to review what is happening with other standards which serve the voluntary carbon market and to learn from their best practices. So it will not just be a, a one-way street, um, but you would hope, I think, to see this, this form of informal influence between the two sections of the market. Um, so that's the first at the international level. I think the second, uh, which is perhaps even what you allude to with the SEC uh, news, is, is really more direct regulation and policy made by governments uh, for markets within their, within their countries. Um, I think this is, as you already alluded to it, Ben, I mean, I, I think the first step is probably to do with reporting. I mean, it, it's a question of um, what are the transparency requirements, uh, particularly if there's now going to be a closer link between this uh, net zero, uh, voluntary net zero targets and offset use. Uh, what is the right balance to strike in terms of uh, how transparent do you need to be? Um, another area is, is very clearly probably going to be um, financial market regulation. More and more offsets will be traded on uh, public exchanges, and so they will need to, to meet uh, different types of regulations. Uh, and then there's the sort of, um, well, there are the areas we haven't yet reached, and these are the things uh, much more intrusive, so to speak, like uh, defining what can and cannot be bought, um, what companies can and cannot say about credits, and also there's a whole uh, area which is around, um, which you can see sort of as consumer protection, i.e. how can you market offsets so consumers make sure they're buying or they know what they are in fact buying. Um, and I know this has been a concern to some in, in previous years. So, so these are some areas which could uh, influence the voluntary carbon market in, in the coming years. But really, I feel we're at the very beginning of this process. And the first step will be some degree of reporting and transparency. Thanks very much, David. Bianca? Um, yeah, so I think I would say the way the rate it's growing, we can see the a lot of voluntary carbon market activity has been growing, especially in the last two years and now, and a lot of companies and corporates are having their net zero strategies. So there's definitely a lot of momentum on the private sector side, and we're seeing that that finance um, is that carbon finance is ready to flow into uh, these projects. So um, that's one thing at least that would drive the policy for the developing countries because they can see that there's interest in this. Uh, but um, like uh, David is saying, it's more on a national level where the regulations are going to actually 
define different aspects of what is required. Uh, we know that there's a lot of discussion on defining what carbon rights is. Is it for the government? Is it for the project developer? What is this process for authorization exactly? Uh, what criteria of sustainable development uh, do we need? So there's a lot of clarity that needs to be had on a national level. And I think the fact that the governments are aware that there's a lot of stakeholder consultation that is required it's something that they want to do properly. They know um, there's a lot of pressure coming in, but they also don't want to risk um, with just uh, allowing operate, um, carbon market activities to just go on without considering all the things that are important. So just the way, like David had mentioned, Indonesia are putting a hold on it. We're seeing a situation where um, there's a clear need for a very clear policy and legal framework so that the countries don't end up not benefiting. And this can take some time. But I think something that's also coming up quite a lot that we see, at least in our region, is the issue of community benefits sharing. And it's taking a lot of center stage because you're seeing the carbon project models also changing. They're being community centric. It's not just about the emission reduction anymore. So countries need to be very clear. What is the community getting? What is the government getting? And then how are the developers also benefiting from all of this? So there's a shift in the way uh, some of these carbon models were being done before, and you don't want a situation where um, the, the host country feels like they're not developing. And also just to mention that for the host country to take part in these cooperative approaches, they need to have these authorization procedures in place. So there's a lot of um, onus on them to have the institutional um, arrangements and infrastructure ready. But something also that's driving this is that now with the NDCs, you're seeing certain sectors having a lot of priority that did not benefit before under the clean development mechanisms. So say, for example, land and um, forestry. We know that in CDM, you had um, the AR and RE um, methodologies only. There was a lot of issues around um, permanence and leakage. But we've seen also the voluntary carbon market has um, developed a lot around this. You've seen new methods coming up to deal with certain issues on permanence, like buffer registries. But basically, all I'm saying is that there's a lot of um, work that's going on to show that you can tap into the sectors that were ideally not, um, were not beneficial before under the CDM. So there's a potential for countries to tap into this for their NDCs. Um, going into new sectors. So I think the VCM is opening up an opportunity where they can choose activities in these sectors that were not touched before, but also they're interested in large scale projects. So there's an opportunity for, for, for this to also keep growing further. So yeah, I think that's about that. Thanks, Bianca and David. Wow, so there really is a lot going on there, isn't there? There's so many different angles to it. And also, I suppose, from the point of view of the buyer and the investor in the voluntary car markets, it really depends on where you're standing. Because if you're a project developer, then you have to be very focused on the issue of authorizations and benefit sharing and ensuring that everything that you do is fully in line with the government requirements, even as those requirements are adapting and developing over time. And that's happening quite quickly now. David, you mentioned the example of um, Papua New Guinea and also Indonesia, which are both kind of um, thinking this through in, in real time. But then also the, the points around greenwashing, around the types of claims that can be made by end users are really interesting. And then also in terms of the market as a whole, Bianca, your point about nature-based solutions and particularly forestry credits, which were not historically a huge part of the clean development mechanism, that there could be a bigger role for them now that the methodologies and the technology for assessing those products has improved is really fascinating. So it sounds like there's there's lots there for, for people to get their teeth into, um, lots lots of risks to be managed and, and lots of change kind of on, on a pretty um, rapid turnaround at the moment. So thanks very much for that. Moving on then, Bianca, I know that you were in Bonn for the UNFCCC intercessionals earlier this month. This is, of course, the first round of climate negotiations since COP26. I know few people expected a major breakthrough on carbon markets in Bonn, but what if any progress was made? Um, and in particular, it'd be great to hear what is happening with corresponding adjustments. Uh, of course, this new accounting rule that was implemented in, in Glasgow, and also with the transition from the CDM to this new Article 6.4 mechanism. Uh, thanks, thanks, Dave. Um, thanks, Ben. So I think it's important to remember that the SBs are more of a session that helps you make sure that you get a good outcome at COP27. They're very technical. Um, so in terms of 
major breakthroughs, I would say you'd have to look into what work was actually being done. But I think the SBs really help in trying to make sure a lot of what you're doing now can make you get a good outcome um, at the end. And for us, what's important is operationalizing uh, 6.4, like uh, David had mentioned before, and operationalizing 6.2 as well, the cooperative um, approaches. So as I mentioned, it's not very glamorous, it's very technical. So a lot of the work was actually on deciding how to do intercessional work before you get to COP27. And for me, um, a good, well, I don't know if it's considered a breakthrough or not, but for the first time in, in quite a long time, I, I, I was seeing countries actually um, agreeing on what kind of um, intercessional work they can have together and actually putting a lot of that um, into the secretariat in the form of doing technical papers and uh, follow-up workshops after that, which is um, very different from the last SB, physical SB session that we had um, where parties were really hesitant on any type of um, technical assistance in, in terms of anything under Article 6. So uh, you asked about corresponding adjustments and I view this like primarily as a government function. So, so they're the ones who have to apply the corresponding adjustments um, after authorization. And the work that was actually mandated at the SBs was around uh, methods, detailing the methods that the countries can choose. So this didn't actually go into much detail uh, during the SB sessions, but I think what's important, especially when we're thinking about the private sector and uh, developers who want to set up projects, is that the countries have the capacity and the infrastructure to do this. And that's literally around um, the topics of reporting and uh, recording and tracking. And for that, um, there was a lot of work that was done before the SBs, a lot of workshops um, and informal that put together everything. But then even at the session, you could still see there's a lot of understanding that's needed on registries, on understanding how you will report this. So um, I think it was good that it was agreed at least there can be some technical papers on registries and how to do this because for the governments, they need this in place for them to be able to to be able to um, um, apply the corresponding adjustments and to report on them. And for for them to be able to authorize projects to do that, they want to be sure that they can actually do this first. So I think there was some good progress on that. Uh, but on the actual actual corresponding adjustments itself, uh, the parties did not agree on a technical paper for it. So it will probably we probably won't go into the details of the methods, but we'll see if we have the infrastructure to enable um, the countries to do that. In terms of CDM transition, um, a lot of this was actually given to the supervisory body, which at least now is constituted, and we'll come up with uh, recommendations on that. But I, there's also a technical paper that the countries agreed could be undertaken to you know, provide further guidance on the transition, because we know that for transitioning of activities, um, it still does need host country approval. So there's definitely some progress in those aspects. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much, Ganga. That's really clear. And just for those in the audience who aren't familiar with the SBs, SBs are the subsidiary bodies, which are the, the two technical bodies underneath the UNFCCC. So referring to the SBs is the same as referring to the bond intercessionals, this meeting that took place earlier this month. And Bianca, a really interesting point you make there about progress was maybe better than a year ago, but um, the progress in the UNFCCC intercessionals looks like agreeing an agenda for a work plan for uh, a group that's going to be delegated to do some research. So I think this speaks to a really interesting point around the, the different speeds at which policymaking works uh, in, in carbon markets at the UN versus the speed of, of change in the voluntary carbon markets more generally, which are able to move a bit faster. Anyway, um, David, over to you. Interesting to hear your reflections in what happened in Bonn earlier this month. Um, yes, I mean, I uh, so I, I totally agree with Bianca. I mean, one should not expect uh, breakthroughs at these kind of meetings. The, these kind of meetings really are there to lay the ground for the COP. Uh, the idea really is everyone gets there their point of view down on a bit of paper, and that is the thing you'll negotiate in, in Egypt this year. So, so um, uh, if any of your audience were brave enough to delve into whatever was done at Bonn and, and they were either confused or a bit disappointed, please don't be. Uh, it'll take form at, at, at the COP. Uh, I have to say, actually, having done for the last couple of years, uh, been to the 
been to these negotiations and, and uh, done the cops as well. Uh, totally, I agree with Bianca. I mean, it, it, it really seems like a very positive outcome for, for me. Um, yeah, a lot, a lot of work was agreed to be done. This kind of thing didn't happen a few years ago. And I think we have to appreciate the nature of uh, this work on carbon markets. A lot of it is detailed, a lot of it is technical. A lot of it is very hard to negotiate with 190 plus countries. Uh, you do need particular experts with particular expertise to be allowed to get on with the work. So the more you can kind of move into that kind of way of working, the quicker progress you can actually make. So in that, in that respect, it was, it was quite positive. Um, I have to say the thing that stuck out for me most of the, the, the recent uh, couple of weeks, in fact, wasn't uh, was negotiated in Bonn, though, it was, uh, Bianca alluded to it, it was the fact that this uh, 6.4 mechanism, uh, which we referred to a couple of times, finally can, can get going. Um, so uh, for your listeners, how this works, basically, it is, it, it is run by a, um, a sort of like a board, I suppose you could say, of uh, about 12 people and they're coming from the UN regional groups and each group must uh, nominate two people. And uh, we have so had so far had six month log jam as a couple of the groups had internal disagreements about who should sit and who should represent them on this uh, on this uh, board. And until it was full, it couldn't start work. And uh, what happened at the last COP was actually it was given an awful lot of work to do. Uh, and uh, until it can meet, none of it can start. And um, just at the very end of this uh, this session in Bonn, uh, we've got the news that finally there's been an agreement and the board has basically now been uh, agreed. We know who the members are and it can get to work. And I think for me, this is a, is a very big outcome because there is uh, there's a lot of work to be done. And one of the big concerns over the last few years was the fact that uh, it would simply take too long to set up this mechanism. Um, and uh, particularly with the clean development mechanism, if that stops generating offsets, but this thing cannot start for a few years, then there's going to be a big gap in between. And so the hope, uh, certainly at last COP, was that you know by 2023, maybe 2024 at the latest, it would be up and running. Uh, we already lost six months now, but um, let us hope that actually with the with the fact that it can start work now, still roughly we can make that uh, timeline. So I think even for the private sector, that is very significant news because. Lots of people will in different ways engage with this mechanism and the quicker this mechanism can move and get up and running, uh, the better for everyone. That's great. Thank you, David. You're both far too diplomatic for me to bother asking you whether they have chosen good people for this board. I'm sure the answer is yes. Everyone there is excellent. But um, yeah, interesting that that has finally been agreed and maybe even a bit sooner than some people expected. And as you said, they can really get going now. On, um, on fleshing out the rules for Article 6.4 uh, to replace the CDM. So you both said that we need to temper our expectations for these bond intercessions every year, that it's always about preparing for the next COP. So maybe we can be a bit bolder then in terms of what we expect to happen at COP27 in five months time. What would you both say are the pessimistic, optimistic and the most likely outcomes on carbon markets there, given where we are now? David. Well, anyone who's followed Article 6 negotiations over the last few years will know what the pessimistic outcome is, and that is uh, no agreements, because we had uh, some of those. But that is not what I expect. Uh, I mean, I, it, it really feels to me the negotiation has turned a, a corner. The, the fundamental dividing lines of the negotiation have been gotten over and, and has entered a new phase. And so my, my feeling uh, from speaking to people in the negotiation, but also just from observing from afar, is that uh, people are there to, to work and get to see uh, up and running and that's good news so i would be more i would be optimistic uh for this cop and there's quite a bit on the agenda to be agreed bianca already mentioned some of it uh for me some of the important stuff is some of the less glamorous uh stuff uh and this includes uh admittedly rather dull sounding reporting tables um which are a big thing uh in the world of the un but essentially it matters because uh, Article 6 really works on, on a reporting basis. I mean, it, it, if you cannot report what you trade, essentially the trade doesn't happen uh, officially under the UN purposes. And, and so there is a lot of reporting in Article 6 and all of it needs to be structured. And so um, they had a mandate actually to develop this uh, by the COP. So that would be a really good outcome uh, because, again, it's another really crucial step of getting the whole system up and running. 
similarly is the question of infrastructure, which is uh, also quite important to people in the private sector because you they'll often find themselves relying on infrastructure in one way or another. I mean, most notably is the, the registry. And for those who are not familiar, the registry is essentially like a bank account which holds uh, carbon offset credits. And at the last COP, um, we were mandated to develop a new registry uh, for this new 6.4 mechanism. Uh, so that needs to be done. Uh, now, that will not be done by this COP, but uh, some progress needs to be made in setting up all of this infrastructure because this infrastructure is basically what sits behind the whole architecture of Article 6. And without the infrastructure, the system doesn't really work. So these are really two very nuts and bolts uh, bits of the system, which uh, keep an eye on for, for COP27, because they will go under the, or, or stay out of the limelight, I should say, but uh, important parts nonetheless. Uh, one thing that's been in the limelight uh, is this issue, uh, some may have seen it, about um, uh, emissions avoidance and uh, this was there at the COP last year. For those who are not familiar, this is really the question of um, can you, what does it mean to, uh, to, to have an avoided emission essentially and there are different interpretations on this and uh, different countries with different interests and lots of people are concerned about it. And so uh, it is a question of defining it uh, Bianca maybe can say a little bit more, she was in the negotiation, uh, but in essence, I mean, my take, uh, admittedly sitting a little bit far away, is it, it's, a, it's a difficult issue. Um, it's not really defined anywhere else. It's always hard to come up with a definition for the first time. Uh, and I wouldn't expect it to, to pose a big problem at the COP, or at least getting in the way of the nuts and bolts things, which I mentioned before, which there seems to be a willingness to make progress on. But as with many things in the UNFCCC, um, some people are very interested in it so uh, there will need a solution will need to be found uh, in some way and, and that can complicate things but I would be cautiously optimistic that there'll be a way through it. David thank you very much and just before I pass over to Bianca can I just check my understanding from speaking to people about this issue about um, avoided emissions in the article 6 negotiations is that it's, it's much narrower than some analysts think because the media have been reporting that maybe Red Plus, for example, avoided emissions from deforestation is in the firing line because of this discussion around whether avoided emissions should be allowed. But I understand that the discussion is, is much narrower and it's specifically um, the test cases, countries which have recently found significant fossil fuel reserves and would like to get some kind of credit on the carbon markets for not exploiting those fossil fuel reserves, for not um, drilling for oil basically now that they can. Am I right in understanding that it's, it's that quite narrow definition of avoided emissions that are under discussion, not the whole concept of any type of avoided emissions? Well, uh, yes, you're, 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 well, uh, Bianca is, I mean, I can give you my understanding and then maybe Bianca uh, can, can perhaps correct me. I mean, yes, uh, fundamentally, I think that part of the issue is that it is not defined. So, um, of course, we talk about emission reduction normally. Um, and so the but you're quite right in terms of uh, even emissions reductions are in one way or another avoided emissions. It's the same kind of thing. But but the big concern is this. Uh, it's non-exploited fossil fuel reserves, basically, and, and whether you would be able to credit uh, not, say, drilling for oil. Um, and, and, and that is that is quite a big concern. Of course, that's an in interest of some countries in the world that have uh, large fossil fuel reserves that if you were to stay within two degrees simply cannot be exploited. Um, so uh, yes, that is that is at the spectrum where people a bit of the spectrum where people are worried about. Thanks, David. Bianca. Um, yes. So yeah, I think maybe I'll just touch on that since you're already on the emissions avoidance before I go into the rest. Um, I do agree with David. A lot of the negotiations was like, which definition are we using of emissions avoidance here? And a lot of the definitions um, that have been put for avoidance can technically fall under emission reductions as well. And then you have different arguments for red that say red plus that it's under reductions, so it's not avoidance. So it really it depends on which specific definition you are relying on. And how it's viewed by some countries is that it's of course it's a priority for, for some, but it's also not a priority for a lot of countries. And the way we see it is that what do we need right now to operationalize? Like this is something that could actually even be tackled when you're dealing with methodologies or, you know, looking at specific sectors um, particularly. So um, it is an issue for some countries, but I also agree with David. I don't see it um, dragging 
taking um, everything too long because it's not um, super urgent to just kickstart uh, 6.4 and 6.2, though, of course, it will always be brought up uh, somehow. Um, then I think in terms of optimism for other parts of um, uh, the, the COP now would be what he's mentioned. I know reporting and infrastructure, it sounds repetitive, but there's so much work that has to be done on this. But I, I, I do think the intercessional work will help quite a bit. So there's the papers and there'll be workshops. And then this issue of registries is, uh, you know, there's a lot of discussion for it under 6.2 in corporate approaches. David has mentioned that 6.4 has its own registry. And we forget there's also a registry in CDM. That, that's, you know, what's going to happen to that. So there's a lot of um, interrelations with all these different uh, registries. You don't want to do repetitive work. You want to just cover it at once. So there is going to be looking into 6.2, CDM, how to make sure that we're covering everything as much as possible, make sure we're not duplicating with reporting. So I think there's definitely um, some positives that will, will come out of that one. Uh, something that I don't think really applies to private sector, but came up quite a bit in the negotiations was on review. So it's important for the countries that because there is so much reporting, how do the countries actually take the recommendations from the review that will come out? They don't want it to be just a review where you say, yes, you reported, but they want it to be sort of quality and credible so they're looking at how recommendations can be made um, and then how to act on inconsistencies. But this, since it's party to party driven, it might be a bit difficult to see how that's sorted. So I'm not quite sure exactly how it will turn out, but um, I think parties will be presenting a lot of views on that. Um, but I am really optimistic on the supervisory body. So I think 6-4 now, um, yeah, even though we've missed six months between now and November, hopefully if they meet once, twice, we can get some really good progress and have it running quite quickly, honestly, because um, everyone is really waiting for it to be operationalized. I think the last thing I'll probably mention is on capacity building. So in COP26, there was a decision that um, the secretariats through the regional collaboration centers would come up with a capacity building program because even for you know, transition, all these things to take place, the countries themselves have to have institutional arrangements and this is all countries, but there is, um, you know, there are countries that will need more support on this. So this um, capacity um, develop this capacity building program needs to start being implemented. And so far, by the time we were at the SBEs, we real um, the update we got was that um, countries had been consulted how they'd like this to look, but we actually need um, a concrete plan on how this will be implemented. So that you don't have countries having the institutional arrangements come in years later, then you end up being late into the game again, which was something that was um, a problem for Africa before, and we we're trying to avoid that. So you really want the institutional setups um, arrangements set up quickly, and this capacity building program is supposed to help with that. So the outcome, at least from the SBs, which I hope will now make it clearer for, for the COP, is that it has a very clear plan and that the countries will be getting updates on this so that everyone at least is on the same page as we keep moving forward. So yeah, those, those are my hopes for COP27, yeah. That's great, thanks Bianca. And just briefly, Bianca, you mentioned review. Could you just say in one sentence what that review is, what's in scope and so on? Sure, sure. So there's a lot of reporting in Article 6. So you have to do an initial report, you have to do a regular report and you have to do a lot of annual information. Uh, which goes into the Article 6 database, but also this reporting is supposed to contribute to the enhanced transparency framework, meaning that your Article 6 activities contribute to what's happening in the biannual transparency report. So this is something on a wider scale that the NDCs, um, that countries have to report on their NDCs. So that's a requirement of the Paris Agreement that each country will you know, do their BTRs and report on this. So the transparency framework has their own review process, but now because Article 6 has uh, so many intricacies, the, those, it was decided that there would be an Article 6 review team. So a lot of discussion was going into, okay, how do we actually comprise the members of this team? Will they need special training? Because a lot of review teams in the UNFCCC process need a lot of training. Um, and then also, how is it different from the transparency uh, review team? How do they complement? Are they working parallel? Are they working after each other? So 
just a lot of <laughs> details on how this works. And it's important for the countries because six do is not centrally mechanized. It's not centrally organized. So you don't have the UNFCCC coordinating it, but countries still need to be at a level of being transparent and credible. So we want this review process to actually make Article 6 uh, more you know, transparent and credible uh, for the whole NDC process. So really it's uh, something that the countries, it wasn't on the agenda before, but countries are saying it's so important uh, for Article 6 to work properly that the review process actually provides proper recommendations to countries that are using this. And that if that, and there's a lot of consistency checks. Like I mentioned, there are three reports going in and like, how is it relating to the NDC reporting? You can have a lot of mistakes. How do you correct that? So, and, and at the same time, it's a very party driven, uh, you know, six is very party driven. So it's really like we can recommend, but how do you actually make sure people listen to what the recommendations are saying? So in that sense, it's a bit different. It's not just ticking a box that you've re um, reported. It's more of like, are you reporting quality? <laughs> So, yeah. That's great. Thanks, Bianca. And yeah, good to hear about quality. We're all about mm -hmm. quality. And, um, and and also just to clarify for the audience, um, the reference there to parties, unfortunately, is not cocktail soirees, but this is actually the, the way in which the countries that have signed up to the Paris Agreement and the UNFCCC are, are referred to, um, because there is one non-country which has signed up the EU. So that's why the term parties is used. Um, as, as they like to say, it is a party-driven process the unit triple C, uh, which also the strap line for the big actual party that happens halfway through the cops. Right, well, we're almost out of time here. This has flown by, so thank you so much both for your insights. I just wanna end by asking you for your hot takes. Imagine, David and Bianca, that the three of us are catching up in July, 2023. What do you think will have been um, the biggest changes in terms of the way in which policy influences the voluntary carbon markets compared to today? Bianca. So I think for me, by 2023, I think there'll be a lot more legal um, frameworks in place such that you're seeing a lot more um, countries having pipelines of different kinds of projects happening. Because that's what the host parties want at the end. They want a pipeline of good projects that are actually contributing to the NDC. And some countries are working faster than others. Um, as we said before, others need support. Um, but I do think that this risk that you know, countries have and private developers have in not having legal frameworks will have reduced. So I think there will be a bit more confidence as to how um, countries are going about authorization. There'll be a bit, yeah. So you'll definitely see more projects coming up and then um, new models as well, as I said, with community benefit sharing at the center of it also showing up. So um, seeing more practical cases and seeing a lot more interest in, in some of these areas um, is something that I think will definitely happen because a lot of countries are aware. I know it seems like they're moving quite slowly. It's just risky. So they want to manage it properly so that you don't have a rush and then you're correcting things later, even though it's a learning by doing process in some instances, you definitely um, will see a policy or regulations of some sorts coming up. Yeah. Thanks, Bianca. David? Um, yeah, it's a, just very briefly on Bianca's point, it, it's super interesting, this question about the law, because uh, in many places, uh, there is simply no law to recognize carbon as an asset. I mean, it's... Uh, it's not easy to invest in because uh, you don't really have any rights over it. Uh, so in many parts of the world, uh, it doesn't exist. And so you'll need to go through a process of implementing some kind of law which gives some ownership over an emission reduction. So that, that is something to keep, a, to keep an eye on. I mean, for me, uh, I think if we're thinking forward a year, one of the things uh, which I would hope to see is um, the various initiatives which are looking at different bits of the voluntary carbon market uh, come together in some kind of cohesive, um, complementary way. So, you know, we have the we have the task force on scaling voluntary carbon markets, which has now become the Integrity Council. We have, uh, forgive the acronyms, but you can look them after afterwards, uh, VCMI, CCQI. We have lots of different initiatives which are trying to look at slightly different elements. Essentially, all they're trying to do is say, what is a good credit? Um, and uh, what can you say about buying a good credit, essentially?
in different in different ways and and I know that the people who have been involved in these initiatives really have tried very hard to make sure there's limited overlap but uh, even for those involved uh, quite closely in this market it can be confusing as to uh, the dividing line between these various initiatives and, and how their outcomes relate to each other so um, I think by this time next year, they would have already, most of them will have produced their, uh, uh, either final outputs or at least their first editions of final outputs. And uh, certainly I would hope that by this time next year, it would be much easier either for the project developer or for the company who's not deeply involved in this market, but just would like to do the right thing um, uh, to be able to understand how this guidance fits together and, and uh, what they can and cannot say, what they should and shouldn't buy. Uh, this would be progress if we can get there by uh, this time next year. That's really fascinating. Thank you so much, Bianca and David, for sharing your time and your expertise with us. And thank you to the audience for sharing your time with us too. I really hope that this discussion was as useful and interesting for you as it was for me. I look forward to diving into the policy aspects of the voluntary carbon markets with you again soon. But for now, all that's left is for me to say bye to our panelists and bye to you. Bye.